complex. Last time we proved certain properties of series addition and multiplication, which I want to recap briefly. If we have a series A, uh, which is the sum of ANs, and B, which is the sum of the BNs, these are simple series, not power series, they're not functions of Z. Uh, then we can multiply each term by a constant K, and we get KA. We can add the terms of the two series, and the sum of this series will be A plus B. And we can multiply the terms in a certain strategic way, which is supposed to remind you of uh, polynomial multiplication. We can multiply every ai by every bj, and then regroup the terms by, by organizing them by the total index, i plus j, and call that cn. Then if we sum the series cn, then we get the product a times b. This is provided the series an converges absolutely. It just takes one to converge absolutely in order to guarantee that this is true. So this law is kind of, it's a lot like polynomial multiplication. Now we want to apply these laws to power series. These are for simple series, but we have analogous laws for power series, and we want to deduce these laws from the simple series versions of the same. So let's assume that we have two power series. f of z is a n z minus a to the n, and g of z is b n z minus a to the n. I want to point out this is not a typo. Uh, this should not be a B. The two power series here are presumed to have the same center. Organizing the product or sum of two power series that are centered at different points is very difficult. But if they're centered at the same point, then uh, it's much more straightforward. So we're going to assume here that these are both convergent power series. And I'm going to remind you of the cauchy hadamard test, which helps you calculate the radius of convergence. But more importantly for our purposes right now, helps to guarantee us that there is a radius of convergence and that the functions will converge absolutely and uniformly on any smaller ball. They'll converge absolutely within the radius of convergence and they'll diverge outside the radius of convergence with some questions on the actual boundary of that, uh, of that disk, that, that circle whose, whose radius is exactly that cap r. So we're assuming here that they have radius of convergence greater than or equal to cap r. Basically, we're going to hope that there's some, we're going to prove that there's some is not any worse about converging than uh, the worst of the two of them. So assuming that they don't, they might not have the same radius of convergence, but each of them has a radius of convergence, at least r. Then if you take one of them and multiply all the terms by a constant, then you get a constant times that function, right? Of course. Um, and this function, k f of z, will have the same radius of convergence uh, as f of z itself, unless k is zero, in which case it will just have infinite radius of convergence. Um, and uh, so that will converge on BAR. So notice, I'm assuming that F converges on BAR, and that will also converge on BAR. For the sum of two series, it's the same thing. Notice that here I'm just adding the AN plus the BN. But in order to apply this law to prove this consequence, I'm actually applying this law to the power series themselves. So I'm taking this entire thing and adding it to this entire thing, but then, of course, the z minus a to the n factors out, and that's why the form takes this. So in order to apply this law directly, what I would get would, would be a n z minus a to the n plus b n z minus a to the n, but I've just factored that out. Um, so that will give us a series for f of z plus g of z simply by applying this law. We're basically applying that law for each z independently, and then we're getting independently for every z a convergence, but that applies to every z in this ball. This one's a little bit subtler. I'm applying part three here to uh, the series whose terms are a n z minus a to the n and b n z minus a to the n. Now, the c that we would get directly here would not just, if, if we just applied this directly, the c would not merely be this. It would be the ith term, namely a i z minus a to the i, times the n minus i term, which would be b sub n minus i z minus a to the n minus i. But when I multiply those together, notice I have this to the i and this to the n minus i, and that will give me a z minus a to the n. So for any given n, all of the terms that I would actually get by multiplying these things by these things would have a factor of z minus a to the n in them, which could then be factored out and placed here. So that's where the z minus a to the n comes from. And that's why, and then having factored them out, the remaining terms are just this, which is pleasantly similar to this. So this is, this is exactly the same as the law for polynomial multiplication, except that it accommodates the fact that a series may have infinitely many non-zero terms. A power series is basically the same thing as a polynomial that got a little bit carried away 
forgot that it that was supposed to have only finitely many non-zero terms. So this is the same law as the law for polynomial multiplication, but it applies for all n, even infinitely many uh, n. So, so here we have these laws. Now, what about convergence? This thing has a special caveat here. At least one of these series has to converge absolutely in, in order for this to make sense. Well, I'm asserting this inside the interior of the ball BAR. So I'm really assuming that the distance from Z, so here's Z, here's R, here's A. I'm assuming that the distance from Z to A is strictly less than R. And if it is, then it must be within some smaller ball. And on that smaller ball, the cauchy hadamard test asserts that we actually have uniform and absolute convergence on that smaller ball. We have uniform and absolute convergence for F, and we have uniform and absolute convergence for, for G, because they each have radius of convergence greater than or equal to R. And if so, then we have this automatically met, right, for the series A n z minus a to the n, or just as well for the series B n z minus a to the n. These are both, both series um, that go into this computation in three satisfy this automatically because the cauchy hadamard test, um, which is ultimately based on the Weierstrass M test, guarantees that we actually do have a, uh, the absolute convergence that we need. And so this is going to be true, and I don't have to give a, a further caveat because it's a consequence of the radius of convergence put, put together with that cauchy hadamard and, and Weierstrass M test work. So this tells us that we may compute the, the product of two power series as easily as we would like to do it. Um, so now these are these are great laws for multiplying and adding, but and they they basically they allow us to treat a power series as truly an authentic sum and do things that feel like simple distribution and simple reorganization of terms, which is very good to be able to do. Um, we needed to check these things because infinite sums are more subtle than finite sums. But now that we've checked these, then we can add and multiply series um, quite easily. What we still need to do is we need to learn how to differentiate series. And so let's talk about this problem first. Um, I'm going to define briefly, and this is going to be a provisional definition. We won't have this definition very long because we'll prove that we won't need it shortly. But provisionally, I'm going to define the formal derivative of a power series. So uh, let's let f of z be the summation a n z minus a to the n, so it's a power series. So we define the formal derivative of f of z to b, and then basically what we do here is we look only at the form of the function and we don't worry about the values of the function and we do what seems and feels and looks right to the form of the function without regard to whether it's actually correct. So um, let's call this, so I'm going to write f prime of z, but then I'm going to critique this notation and change it. So we're going to write the summation n equals 0 to infinity of a n, which is a constant, times n times z minus a to the n minus 1. So here, why am I saying this is what looks right? Because we're simply applying the power law, and arguably the chain rule too, to the form z minus a to the n, in order to get n z minus a to the n minus 1. And if you're worried about I have to multiply by the derivative of the inside function, well, OK, that's valid. But the derivative of the inside function is 1, so I don't need to write anything to multiply it. Um, I also have this a n here, which is a constant multiple. And then I differentiated the sum by writing the sum of the derivatives. And that's really the question here. I have a sum law for derivatives that allows me to, to sum up two things and deal with the derivative of, of the sum of two things. But this is an infinite sum. And the real question here is, is it correct to propagate the derivative operation across this infinite sum? That's what we're really questioning here. And as long as we're questioning that, then I shouldn't really write f prime here, because that's really the content of this question. Is this or isn't this? the true derivative of the function f. So provisionally here, I'm going to write f1. Uh, I'm just going to subscript a 1 here. Call this f1. We're going to call it the formal derivative, and we're not going to call it the derivative, but then we're going to prove that it is actually equal to the derivative. And once we prove that, then we're going to stop writing f1, and we're going to stop calling it the formal derivative, and we're going to call it the derivative, because we have a theorem that justifies that. 
So that's the direction that we're going with this. Now, there are a few things that we need to take care of first. The first thing we need to uh, deal with is the radius of convergence. So before I even try to prove that this thing is equal to the derivative, I'm going to try to prove that it converges when the original function converges. And we're going to use, of course, the Hadamard test for that, because the, the ratio test is sometimes not applicable. And so um, let's say and prove that first. So our first theorem about the formal derivative. So if r is equal to the radius of convergence, of f, then r equals the radius of convergence of f1. So um, basically, they have the same radius of convergence. And this goes, if the radius of convergence is 0, then it means that it's also 0. And if it's infinite, then same thing. So how are we going to prove this? Well, we're going to prove this by the cauchy hadamard test. So um, there's a little bit of a problem. Let me, let me sort of naively try to apply the cauchy hadamard test to this form. And then I'll point out that uh, there is a little bit of a, a sticky problem that requires a little bit of an adjustment. So um, it is correct to apply the cauchy hadamard test. But the first time I'm going to do it, I'm going to sort of do it wrongly to make a point. So let's have a look. So apply the cauchy hadamard test to this function, um, so 2f1 of z. So, um, so what do we get? Well, we get the square root, so r equals um, 1, well, we're going to get the radius of convergence for f1 is 1 over the limb soup um, of a n times n modulus to the 1 over n. OK? And now you can expect I'm going to prove some, I'm going to do some things with limit laws, right? Here's the coefficient a n times n now. And I'm going to do some things with limit laws and see what happens. And that's basically correct. But there's an error in this proof so far. And it's a very important error that is really easy to make in other examples. So I want to call special attention to it. So the, the error is. That's not the nth coefficient of that power series. So notice that when we differentiated the power series, the degrees changed. The n equals 0 term is actually gone. You should worry about z minus a to the, to the minus 1 power, but you don't have to worry because that has an n equals 0 there. So that term is actually completely gone. Um, it's okay to write the sum from n equals 0 to infinity. If it, makes you, if it bothers you, they have 0 and then 0 here, you can write n equals 1 to infinity to exclude that term. Um, but this power of z minus a is now n minus 1, which means the, when we get like the 10th power of z minus a here, we don't get an a 10 times 10. We get an a 11 times 11. And that means that we're kind of off by one. If we've attempted here, I mean, the, the cauchy hadamard test says, hey, take the nth coefficient of your power series and raise it to the 1 over nth power. Well, a n times n is not actually the nth coefficient of the power, power series. It's the, it's, it's the prior one. So um, it's, it's the n minus 1 coefficient of the power series. And so we need to solve this problem. Um, now, one way to solve this problem is to recognize that this is the n minus 1th term, and I'll take this to the, to the 1 over n minus 1. This is now actually correct. I mean, it's not friendly, but it is correct here. Um, but there's an easier solution. And that is to say, well, if I modify this by multiplying it by z minus a, I know that that won't change the powers. I, I, I know that that won't change the radius of convergence. So that's what we're going to do. So first notice that f1 of z and z minus a f1 of z have the same convergent of, uh, let's say, domains of convergence.
Why? Why do they necessarily have the same domains of convergence? This is an infinite sum, and it's possible that it doesn't converge. It's possible you don't get a finite answer out of this. But the exciting bit about this infinite summation is that n is going to infinity and that there are infinitely many n's involved. So for various values of z, these terms might do strange things, and these infinitely many values might sum to something infinite or, or give you a problem, and for other values they might sum to something finite. But if I multiply all of these terms by a constant, that's not going to change the basic question of whether they converge, right? And what is a constant? I mean, 3 is a constant, but a constant for this, from the point of view of this summation is, would really be any value that doesn't depend upon n. And z minus a is independent of n. So this is basically because z minus a does not depend on n. From the point of view of the summation on n, from the point of view of the actual mechanics of the series itself, z minus a is a constant. And therefore, multiplying by it doesn't change the values at which we get convergence. It, 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 it changes the value that it converges to, but it doesn't change the actual question of does it converge or does it not converge, and therefore it doesn't change the radius of convergence. The function is going to have some sort of radius of convergence, it might converge to something different, but it'll have the same radius of convergence. So if I'm only trying to calculate the radius of convergence, then it's safe to pre-multiply by z minus a. Now, why do I want to do that? So z minus a, um, f1 of z, is equal to the summation n equals 0 to infinity of a n times n times z minus a to the n, which solves the problem that I had before, the problem that a n times n was not the nth term of this series? Well, now it is, right? I've just shifted all the terms back up one degree um, so that a n times n really is the first term of the series now. So um, this allows me to correct the problem that I had before and allows me to calculate the um, radius of convergence of this and take for granted that that's equal to the radius of convergence of the formal derivative. So, so let's do that. Um, so the radius of convergence for z minus a times the formal derivative is 1 over the lim soup of um, the nth term, which now truly is n, uh, a n times n, then modulus, then to the 1 over nth power, which is equal to 1 over. Um, now, I'm going to split this up a little bit. This is the lim soup of a n to the 1 over n times n to the 1 over n. And I don't need modulus or absolute value around the n because that's an, that's an integer. Um, and I mean, it's a, it's a non-negative value, so I don't need the absolute value signs here. Now, uh, the reason I split it up was because, well, I mean, this is familiar, right? That's, the, that's what we use to predict the radius of convergence for f. Um, so now uh, I'm going to use a limit lock here. If you're calculating a limb soup of a product, that's not always equal to the product of the limb soups. But um, if one of these actually has a limit, and that limit is defined, then you can split up this limb soup. So I'm going to split up this limb soup. That's going to be 1 over the limb soup of a n to the 1 over n uh, times, this is all in the denominator here, times the limit of n to the 1 over n n goes to infinity. Um, so that is, I mean, that is guaranteed to be true if I calculate this limit and it turns out that the limit actually exists. Well, now we have this annoying limit n to the 1 over n. And you might think, well, you know, he's going to do the regular calculus stuff. But if you look a couple videos back, we had a special trick for calculating a n to the 1 over n. And that special, well, we had a special trick for calculating this limit, and that special trick was essentially the ratio test. So let me remind you, so we have a special ratio test trick. So if the limit of a n plus 1 over a n modulus exists, then it equals 
um, then it equals the limb soup of a n to the 1 over n. This we proved when we were proving the ratio test. So I'll refer you to that video to remind you how that worked. If you can actually calculate this limit, now you might think, oh, well, how could I calculate? I'm not going to, this, like the way I've written it to remind you of the ratio test looks like it applies to this and I'm going to use it to apply it to this, but I'm not. I'm going to apply it to this. So in other words, I can calculate this if I can calculate the analog for the ratio test. So let me say what that means. Thus, if the limit of n plus 1 over n exists, then it equals um, the limit of n to the 1 over n. So I'm taking this fact that we proved on the way to the ratio test, and I'm applying it to this thing, which looks like a sort of a cauchy hadamard calculation, but it's really just an ordinary limit. And this fact that we proved on the way to the ratio test assures us that if I can calculate this, then it predicts the value of that. And this is really super easy. So the limit of n plus 1 over n is the limit of 1 plus 1 over n, which is clearly 1. So that means that this thing, which is our effort to calculate this, that this thing is actually 1. So if you, you can test this on a calculator if you like. Take the number 1,000 and raise it to the 1 over 1,000 power, and you'll get an answer close to 1. So if we continue this calculation, then this becomes 1 over, and then this is just 1. And so we get 1 over the limb soup of a n modulus to the 1 over n, which is exactly the radius of convergence for the original function f of z. So the radius of convergence of z minus a times the formal derivative is the same as the radius of convergence of the original function, and is also, by the argument given before, the same as the radius of convergence of the formal derivative. And this shows us that the radius of convergence of the formal derivative agrees with the radius of convergence of the original function. So it might, it might not be the derivative, at least, you know, as of yet, we don't know that. It might not be the derivative, but at least it is a function. And it's a function with essentially the same domain. So that's a good start. But it's obviously it's not enough. So we need to show next that this, this function, which we're calling the formal derivative, actually converges to the derivative. So let's do that next. So um, we need to show that that is the derivative. So what does it mean to say that that is the derivative of the function? It means that we can take the limit of f of w minus f of z over w minus z, and we can um, and, and then it'll be equal to that. So now that we know that these are both functions, let's simply say, suppose we have this function and it's a power series. And uh, let's uh, let, uh, let f1 be the well, f1 of z be the formal derivative. So then f prime of z equals f1 of z. That's what we're trying to prove next. So um, we need to we know the definition of f prime, it's the limit. So we will prove. that the limit as w approaches z of f of w minus f of z over w minus z is equal to the formal derivative. And so what are we going to do? We're going to subtract we're going to subtract this and then we're going to show that uh, we're going to basically we're going to use the definition of the limit directly. So let's let epsilon be greater than 0 and consider the difference between this thing and that thing. So consider the modulus of the difference 
f of w minus f of z over w minus z minus the formal derivative. And I have to show that that's small. Right? I have to show that for w sufficiently close to z, that's less than epsilon. How are we going to do that? Well, f of w is a, is a power series. And getting control of a power series is kind of interesting. We can get approximate control of the power series by taking the first n terms or so. And then we can control the rest of the terms to be small, because the convergence of a power series will entail that the, the, the infinitely many terms at the end will be small in some sense. And so if we're trying to get control of uh, a power series function in the context of a limit, it's useful to split that power series into um, what I think of as a head and a tail, right? The head is the first million terms or so, and then the tail is the, the last infinitely many terms. The first million terms you can get under control because that's a finite sum and you can do finitary things to it. And then the last infinitely many terms, you get control of those by simply arguing that, well, whatever is going on there, the convergence of the series means that they must be small. So uh, that's the basic spirit of what we're going to do here. And in order to do it, let's introduce some notation. Let's call this Sn of z plus Rn of z. And let me here implicitly define Sn and Rn. Um, Sn is going to be the summation i equals 0 to uh, n, uh, let's do n minus 1, of uh, a n z minus a to the, no, a i z minus a to the i, and um, that's plus, that's s n, and then r n is going to be the sum of the rest. Uh, i plus n to infinity of uh, a i z minus a to the i. And it occurs to me that changing the summation index in midstream is probably going to cause a lot of confusion. So let me actually go and fix, fix this up so that these are actually depending on some cap n, because I think that that will make things uh, easier for everyone. So um, let's call this s sub cap n and r sub cap n. And this will be um, n equals cap n to infinity. And then this will be n's. Okay. So uh, just a little change in notation there from what I intended to do, but I think that'll make it easier for you. Um, so basically what's going on here is I'm taking this infinite sum and I'm splitting it into two finite sums. The first cap n many terms um, and the last cap n many terms. And then of course, this is S sub cap n and this is R sub cap n. And they're both functions of Z. Um, and I'm making some split, and the split is at this cap n position, and I haven't specified what is the value of cap n. For now, think of it as a million. Um, the proof is not quite going to function unless I specify the value of cap n, but the point is we're going to do some computations, and we're going to try to get control of this term, and then later we're going to figure out what decisions we need to make about this cap n. So that's, uh, that's the general strategy here. Now here, um, f is certainly the sum of these two things, right? So here in this definition, of, in this difference quotient, I can sub in Sn plus Rn and Sn plus Rn. So this is going to be the, the modulus of Sn of z plus Rn of z, and it's R for remainder and S for nothing in particular, uh, and then minus S sub n of z minus R sub n of z. So the S is the head of the series, and the R is the tail of the series. And then that's minus the formal derivative, of course. So um, split that series into head and tail, head and tail. And then, of course, this fraction can be, like, I can bring the s's together, and I can split the fraction. I can bring the r's together, and I can split the fraction. And that's exactly what we're going to do. So um, let's do that next. So I, I guess it'll probably fit here. So let's split the fraction into two. So we get uh, Sn of z minus Sn, that should be w, uh, that and that should be w. So Sn of w minus Sn of z over w minus z. And then this is Rn of w minus Rn of z over w minus z. Actually, let's rearrange two, because that one, I'm going to want that on the other side. So that's, let's do minus 
F1 of Z here, and then we'll move the R's to the other side. So Rn of W minus Rn of Z over W minus Z. So I'm trying to arrange things to make things easier for myself um, by moving the R's over here and getting this group together here, but this is all just basic algebra. So um, now we can make the argument that this is pretty close to F1, but actually I want to make a more direct argument that this is actually pretty close to the derivative of Sn of Z, which it should be obvious because that's the difference quotient for Sn of Z. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to add and subtract the derivative of Sn of Z because I know that's going to converge to the derivative of Sn of Z. So what will that give me? That will give me Sn of W minus Sn of Z over W minus Z minus Sn prime of Z and then plus Sn prime of Z and then minus F1 of Z and then plus this weird dis difference quotient for uh, these guys, for these remainders. And these are the hardest parts to deal with because these are the, these are the ones that are truly infinite, right? So um, those are going to be hard to deal with. Now, before we do anything really significant, um, let's apply the triangle inequality and split this into this group and this group and this group. And then we're going to try to get epsilon over 3 control over each group. So let's see what happens here. So um, nothing really exciting happens. We split this into three groups. W minus Z minus S cap N prime of Z. Uh, this will be less than or equal to, of course, because I'm applying the triangle inequality. And then I get S prime N of Z minus F1 of Z. And then I get this guy. Now this last one looks like a derivative, I mean it looks like a difference quotient used to compute a derivative, but notice that I don't have minus r prime, right? I don't have a derivative there. I'm going to have to get some sort of absolute control over here. This one is looking pretty good, so let's just take stock here. This one I'm just going to have to argue it's small. This one is looking pretty good. Um, this one is uh, a difference quotient of a function Sn. And it's derivative, so like that will be pretty easy to control uh, because we know that this difference quotient converges to the derivative. And there aren't any finite sums on this. I, I want to point out here, these are all, sorry, there aren't any infinite sums. These are all finite sums. Even Sn prime is just, you know, the derivative of a sum of finitely many things. So there's nothing infinite or scary about this. This is just an ordinary, um, is it a polynomial? Yeah, this is just a polynomial. Uh, the difference quotient of a polynomial converging to the derivative of a polynomial. So this is actually like the easiest to deal with. Um, what is Sn prime and its relationship to F1? Well, Sn prime is uh, this thing for the first n terms. And the first n terms of F are the same first n terms for which we took the formal derivative to calculate the formal derivative, right? And so Sn prime is exactly equal to the first n terms of the formal derivative. And so this is actually looking pretty good too, because we know by just applying the rules for polynomial derivatives that the first n terms of, uh, we, we know that Sn prime consists of the first n terms of the formal derivative, because it's the derivative of the first n terms of f. And so we know that um, this is the head of, of this series. So F1 is an infinite series, and Sn prime is the first n terms of it. And so, well, that's pretty good, right? That's something. Um, this one is really the devilish one that we are going to have a little bit of control, a little bit of uh, issues with. Um, so, there, so let's focus our attention on this and see what we can do. So I'm going to just sort of... Uh, draw a dotted line here, and then I'm going to only concern myself with Rn of W minus uh, Rn of Z over W minus Z. All right, what can we do here? Rn is an infinite sum. Uh, it's this infinite sum, and so it's going to be a little bit challenging to figure out how we deal with that. So um, what is Rn? So I need to actually apply the formula up here. So Rn of W minus Rn of z over w minus z 
this thing is, well, Rn of w is this thing with a w in for z. So this is the summation n equals n to infinity of a n w minus a to the n, and then minus the summation n equals n to infinity of a n z minus a to the n over uh, w minus z. Now, this might look basically impossible to, to work with, but it's not all that bad. This is an infinite sum, and this is an infinite sum. This has an an, this has an an. These things can be combined. Um, so let's combine them and see what happens. So this is the summation of an times uh, this weird quantity, w minus a to the n minus z minus a to the n. And then that's w minus z. Now, this thing is a difference between two nth powers. And so let's just, you know what, let me just, what I want to do here is I want to take this w minus z, which doesn't depend on n, and I think it'll make it easier to understand if I just take this w minus z and move it inside, like move it inside the summation and group it with these terms. So I think that will make it easier to see what's happening. Um, so a n and then uh, w minus a to the n minus z minus a to the n over w minus z. And w minus a is w minus a minus z minus a, isn't it? So let's actually play a little fun trick here and call that w minus a over z minus z minus a, which is the same as w minus z, isn't it? So then this thing gets grouped like this. And then of course we have the modulus on the outside. <sighs> something to the n minus something else to the n. Something minus something else. That's supposed to ring a bell. That's how we sum a geometric series. And so this thing can be rewritten as a, um, as, as a sum of these things combined. So let me, let me uh, note here what's really going on abstractly. If we have a to the n minus b to the n over a minus b, then that's equal to uh, a to the n plus uh, minus 1 plus a to the n minus 2 times b plus a to the n minus 3 b squared plus and then through plus b to the n plus uh, minus 1. Um, so this is pretty sloppy. Let me rewrite that. So a to the n minus 1 minus, no, plus a to the n minus 2b plus throughout plus a b to the n minus 2 plus b to the n minus 1. So this um, something to the power minus something else to the power over the difference can be rewritten this way. And if you don't believe me, just multiply this on both sides by an a minus b and you'll see that everything cancels and you end up with a to the n minus b to the n. So this is going to be our expansion of that, which is going to be pretty awful, right? So let's do that. Um, so that's going to be the summation n equals 0 to infinity of a n. And then what on earth is going on? So now we have um, w minus a to the n minus 1 plus, this will all be on one line. Um, so this is going to be w minus a to the n minus 1 plus w minus a to the n minus 2 times z minus a plus, and then we end with z minus a to the n minus 1. And I've, uh, uh, I've messed up this sum. This is supposed to be from cap n to infinity in every case. So I think I, I, think I started the error here. Okay. So the, that's because it's the tail, it's, it's the r, it's supposed to start at that. So this is the sort of the geometric formula simplification of this. It still has to be a modulus. And now, well, it's a mess, isn't it? But um, if z is a point inside the radius of convergence of the function f, and if w is sufficiently close to z, then w minus a and z minus a are both numbers that are strictly less than the radius of convergence of f. And so um, what we can say here is that this is a 
a number strictly less than the radius of convergence, and this is another number strictly less than the radius of convergence, and we can choose um, a value r that a value little r that uh, is between modulus w minus a and modulus z minus a, which is an upper bound for both. So then we can get a lot of tight control over here. So let's do that. Um, first, I'm going to just apply a whole bunch of triangle inequality here, and then we're going to get bounds on, on all of these moduli. So the first triangle inequality I'm going to apply is the triangle inequality, the infinite triangle inequality for this infinite summation, which we've proven previously. And the next I'm going to apply is the triangle inequality for this sum of n many terms here. Um, and then we're going to get control over w minus a and z minus a. So this is going to be less than or equal to the summation n equals cap n to infinity of modulus a n times, now this is going to be w minus a to the n minus 1 plus, and then w minus a to the n minus 2 times z minus a. And then finally, modulus z minus a to the n minus 1. So for any z in the ball around a of radius r, so let's draw that ball. Uh, let's draw it over, well, I'm kind of running out of room, and I don't want to erase yet. So let's draw that ball here. So we have something here. And then for any z, then um, there is some, so there is some little r um, and it's greater than the modulus of z minus a and it's less than the modulus of r and for w close enough to z then also w minus a is less than r, is less than z, uh, cap r. And so what we can do here is we can, so the r is like here maybe. This value is gonna be little r. So that even on a neighborhood of z, all the w's in this neighborhood will still have a distance from a which is less than little r. So what that empowers us to do is to replace all of these moduli with a little r. And when we do, they actually combine because the total power here is n minus 2 and the total power here is n minus 2 and the total power everywhere is, no, not n minus 2, n minus 1. The total power everywhere is n minus 1. And so if we replace every one of these with a little r, then they'll combine. There are n of them and they'll all get combined. So this is going to be less than or equal to the summation n equals n to infinity, it's actually strictly less, uh, modulus a n times, now I get r to the n minus 1, but I have n of these terms, so I get n r to the n minus 1. And so that is our control uh, over this term. Now, is it good enough? <laughs> like, I don't know. Like. I need to be able to show that that's less than epsilon over 3. So um, hopefully that's a tight enough control that we can get it less than epsilon over 3. What can we do? Take a drink so we don't lose our voice. So how do we get this thing under control? Well, remember that however long ago, half an hour ago in this video, um, remember that the first thing I did was I showed that the radius of convergence of the formal derivative was equal was was the same as the radius of convergence of the function. That wasn't just for good measure. That wasn't just a sanity check. We're actually going to use that here because this is an instance of the formal derivative, or it is rather, it's actually, um, it's what you get when you take a tail of the formal derivative and put absolute value signs around everything. Well, who cares? Well, if, if r is less than cap r, and if cap r is known to be the radius of convergence of the formal derivative, then that means that for little r here, basically plug in 
little r plus a for z, this formal derivative is absolutely convergent, which means when I slap absolute value signs around everything here and plug in z equals a plus little r so that this ends up being an uh, that should be a minus one, so that this ends up being an r to the n minus one, when I perform that action, I already know that this is an absolutely convergent series because little r is within the radius of convergence. Okay, so what? Well, but this isn't just a whole absolutely convergent series. This is a tail of an absolutely convergent series. And the tail of an absolutely convergent series can be made arbitrarily small, right? Um, so um, if I've chosen this little r, um, then for some cap n large enough, the tail of this of this absolutely convergent series is going to be less than epsilon. So, um, so for um, for n sufficiently large, um, this thing is going to be less than epsilon over three. And the reason is because it is the tail of, an, of a series known absolutely convergent. Why do we know it's absolutely convergent? Because we calculated the radius of convergence of, um, of the formal power series. And we know that it's greater than this value, little r. So, um, so that gives us control over this term, which is by far the hardest term. It's not enough. It shows us that this term is less than epsilon over 3. We now need to control this term, and we need to control this term. And if we can control both of those to be less than epsilon over 3, then we'll be, uh, then we'll be all set. So um, here we go. So what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to summarize what we learned about this term here. So um, for n large enough, this is strictly less than epsilon over 3. And I'm going to replace it here with an epsilon over 3. And now um, let's argue about the other terms here. So let's go to the next one down, Sn. Uh, prime z minus f1 of z. Well, I already sort of hinted at what's going on here. Um, notice, so Sn prime of z is, um, well, what is it? Sn is a polynomial. That's the derivative of a polynomial. We know how to differentiate the polynomial. That's the sum n equals 0 to n minus 1 of um, n a n z minus a to the n minus 1. And we know that that is a true derivative, right? When I say Sn prime, I mean that's really the derivative of that thing. That's not just the formal derivative. The formal derivative is the derivative because that's a, pol that's a polynomial, and we know that derivatives work in the usual way for polynomials. But that is, um, so which is the um, first n minus 1 terms of the power series, um, which is f, the formal derivative. So if Sn prime of z is the first n minus 1 terms of that thing, and if furthermore um, we have convergence of that power series, which we do inside the radius of convergence, then um, we can be assured that this thing can be made up as close as we want to that, at least, at least um, for, uh, for any given z. But we also know that on any ball little r, whose radius is slightly less than capital R, we actually get uniform convergence of the uh, beginning of the power series to the uh, power series itself. And so that uniform convergence is going to be handy because then we know that we don't have to worry about um, which value of z we're actually talking about here. So um, actually, so 
So thus, for n sufficiently large, um, so Sn prime of z minus F1 of z modulus is going to be less than epsilon over 3. And uh, now that I'm thinking about it, this doesn't have a W in it, so I don't even really need the uniform convergence. This can, I can just use uh, the, the convergence at the single point Z there. So uh, Z is within uh, that thing, and so Z is within this radius, and so uh, this thing converges to that thing. And so, well, by the definition of convergence, the difference between them must be less than epsilon over 3 for a sufficiently large n. And that's all the control we need for that. Now, <coughs> the n that is sufficiently large to make this true, and the n that is sufficiently large to, be, to make this true, those are going to be unrelated values of n. And so ultimately here, you have to take the maximum of the n so that both of them become true. But when that is done, then we get this thing controlled less than epsilon over 3. And now I'm going to erase that justification, and we'll work on this term, um, and we'll see what happens next. So let's summarize what we did to this term. So for n uh, large enough, uh, this is less than epsilon over 3. And let's look at this term. Now, this term is, is different um, because, well, this term has a w in a way that we really have to care about. Um, and so, um, because this term is a, our control of this term comes from the definition of the derivative, and we need to think about the value of w in order for this term to be under control. So here, um, this is the difference between the difference quotient and the actual derivative. And notice that Sn is just, a, just this polynomial. So for uh, w in, well, let me say, so there is some delta greater than zero so that for w in the ball of radius, uh, the ball around z in radius w, um, this thing minus the actual derivative that thing is going to be less than epsilon. I can say epsilon, but I can also say epsilon over 3. Why? Because this thing converges to that, and it converges as w approaches z. So we're not talking about as n approaches something. We're talking about now as w approaches z. And we're not picking n large enough. We're picking w close enough to z so that this thing will be less than epsilon over 3. If w is close enough, then it will be less than epsilon over 3. And if that delta needs to be modified so that, so that the w is furthermore assured to stay within some ball um, here, then it may, right? So this w needs to be small enough that it will make this true, but also later might need to be small enough so that w is assured to be within that ball of radius little r, which is inside that ball of radius capital R inside, which is the, the radius of convergence. So for some delta, then that's true. So I've got control here, but it's a weird kind of control. Um, so what I've really shown here, I want to point out the, the mode of control here. I want to say then, and in summary, this is less than epsilon over 3, this is less than epsilon over 3, this is less than epsilon over 3. And those things were all bounds for this. And so what I'm going to conclude here is that this thing um, w minus z minus f1 of z, which is the difference between the, dis the difference quotient that we're interested in and the formal derivative, that that thing is then less than epsilon. But there, there may be a concern here, and I want to put your mind at rest if you're paying attention to what conditions are necessary for, for us to get this thing less than epsilon. So this is the kind of condition that we would expect. We would expect to say for some delta, then this thing, like, because, because the derivative is a limit as w approaches z. So the definition of that limit says for every epsilon, there should be a delta. There absolutely should be a delta. 
that describes a delta ball around z, and then within that ball, this should be less than epsilon. So like the fact that we've produced a delta and said, okay, for delta appropriate, then, then this will work. That's totally normal for reasoning about a limit as w approaches z. What's not normal is that we've also produced a cap n. We've essentially shown here that if w is close enough to z, and if furthermore cap n is large enough, then this will be true. And so is that consistent with the definition of the limit as w approaches z? Like that's kind of, that's kind of weird that we have to furthermore assume that n is large enough. We assume that n was large enough to get control of these terms, but ultimately this does not depend on n, and this does not depend on n. So basically what we're saying here is, for some very, very large n, we have demonstrated that all of this is true, and that is the n that helps us prove that this is true. But its truth, of course, doesn't depend upon n, because none of these values actually depend upon n. So n helped us in the approximation. We had to choose a large value of n in order to get the approximation working, but the actual fact of the matter depends only on delta, and depends on w being within the delta ball of z, and does not depend on n, because nothing here in this formula depends on n. And so we've used it to get control of these terms, but it's not an essential part of the conclusion here. What is the conclusion? The conclusion is thus um, f1 of z is equal to f prime of z. The formal derivative is the derivative and converges on the same ball. Um, thank goodness. Now, um, as sometimes happens in mathematics, if I had written f prime instead of f1 here, it would have caused terrible confusion throughout the proof. I had to introduce a notation for the formal derivative for the, for the duration of this proof. But now that the proof is over, we can see that the f1 notation is redundant because we've proven that it's equal to f prime. So we will drop the, the notation of f1 and we will drop this language of formal derivative because we will stop worrying about whether that is the formal derivative or the actual derivative. We will call this the derivative of the power series instead of the formal derivative because we are now assured that, it's, that everything is okay. So, um, so this is kind of like a temporary notation and a temporary language. Once this theorem is established, we'll just call this the derivative.